All right. Shriram Krishnamurti is a professor at Brown University and he uh, created many influential systems. Today he's going to talk about uh, logic in our systems configuration. Thank you. Um, back row, can you hear me? Raise your hand. Back row, raise your hand. You can't hear me? Back row, raise your hand. Okay, good. All right, Peter's reading his email. Okay, good. So, um, you know, there's sort of an organizational principle when you run a session like this, that when you have something as amazing as what you just saw, you also have to have sort of the dual. That's a very good mathematical principle. So it's my responsibility to be the dual talk today. OK, so um, I'm going to take you, you know, uh, Aaron said that you, know, you have to climb this cliff to start on API. What I'm going to do in the next slide is I'm going to throw you off the cliff that you came from. And I'm going to take you actually a little deeper into the ocean uh, by starting to talk a little bit about Cisco iOS policies. Okay? So uh, this is the kind of thing that you find on the internet. Uh, you know, used to be that there were websites that system configurators went to hang out in, basically like Stack Overflow. But today, now it's sort of Stack Overflow. It's like, look, you know, it immediately starts with you know the, the like frowny character. So you know, this can't be good. And I've been trying to make my router do something. Blah 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 blah. Okay. So let me try to distill this problem down to a pretty typical small business configuration. Okay. So here's the kind of thing you might see. Uh, you've got the big bad internet out there. I've tried to present it in a slightly cheerful way, but we know it's not such a nice place. Um, and you might have different kinds of employees on the inside, right? So you've got maybe the regular employees, like the people who actually write the code. Um, you have maybe some contractors who maybe have to have slightly different privileges. And then, of course, you know, you have the boss who doesn't actually do anything but gets everybody else to do work for them, okay? And so it's quite common when you have a system configuration that you have a bunch of things in the middle that a network person, many of you here I think are familiar with this sort of thing, would call a DMZ, right? Sort of a demilitarized zone. So the idea is that the uh, outside world and the inside world have some mediation between them. Okay, I'm not sure which side of this is North Korea, which side is South Korea, but you know, <laughs> take, take your pick. Okay, and so you have some, uh, uh, you have maybe like a firewall, a router that has two interfaces, one to the external world, one to the DMZ, and similarly on the internal side, you have the internal to the DMZ. Make sense so far? Good. Okay, now, now that I have your attention, I need to give you a warning. Okay, so my warning is that basically I'm, you know, I'm natively Indian. So we tend to speak pretty fast, and when I get excited, I speak really fast. So at any point when you don't understand what I'm saying, this will not be for the reasons for the previous talk. This will be for different reasons, okay? <laughs> different linguistic reasons. Um, you just raise your hand, wave, and say, hey, you're going too fast, I'll slow down. Okay, we're good? Can you do that? Yes. yes? Okay, good. Okay, so now let's take a look at what a system configuration for this might look like, okay? So we're gonna try to configure that uh, firewall router device over there. So usually you have a blacklist, right? All sorts of things that you don't want to have coming in, you knock out, and maybe you have some things you don't want to go out. Maybe you allow some protocols to go outside, uh, but maybe you don't, right? So you get to decide which things you want to allow, which things you don't want to allow. Um, you certainly want to allow the outside world to talk TCP to your web server, right? That's the whole point of having a web server. Similarly, you wanted to allow, you know, you want to be able to deliver email, maybe not anymore, but just pretend you want email still, okay? Um, oh, and uh, you know, when you're configuring the outside, it turns out like maybe you don't want the internal people to be able to you know, download viruses from the internet or something, but for business reasons, it's very, very important for the manager. <laughs> <laughs> Critical, strategy, strategy reasons, okay? And uh, everything else you disallow, right? Usually you say nothing else is permitted. Okay, make sense? Okay, and now, uh, so the way you do this is you have like some sort of hideous language or the other. Okay, it's uh, it's it's literally the polar opposite of APL, if you will, and it's a language called iOS from Cisco. Juniper has its own language. Everyone has their own miserable language for doing this. Okay, so I, I mean I'm like a racket person at heart, and every time I see this, like you know, like an angel dies or something like that in my life. But you know, th these are the things that people write. This is not even the syntax, right? This is just like a made-up convenient syntax to because I didn't want to like hurt your eyes. So, so you have some language like this. Okay, good. So now you have the other firewall also to configure. So what are we going to do on this firewall? We're going to say, well, nothing from this side can initiate a connection to the inside, right? Because that's the whole point. Like only connections that you initiate from the inside should come back. You don't want to let these things start initiating things because that's the whole point of having a DMC. Okay. 
Um, and maybe you say that contractors are not allowed to use their email. Maybe they have a different mail server or something like that. Um, but you want to allow everybody else to be able to access the web server and to access the mail server. And uh, you know, pretty much everything else is blocked. Okay? Now, those of you who have a home uh, Wi-Fi network, uh, which is pretty much everyone these days, uh, unless you're some like seriously crazy hacker person, um, you probably know that what happens is all the machines in your house get routed to a single address, like a fake address, and then that fake address is the thing that actually gets sent to the outside world. So it doesn't leak too much information about what's going on inside your house. This is called a NAT, a net a network address table translation thing. But if you're not familiar with that, just assume that the outside world only sees one address, and the job of the NAT is to do the uh, the, 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 the demuxing, the muxing and the demuxing for the packets going in there. Okay? So far so good? Okay? And there's, so, so similarly there's a protocol, something like this. Okay? So you write some rules and maybe write some NAT rules and so on. Okay? We're good? You understand the general layout of the problem we're dealing with? This is what that poor person on the internet was having to deal with and lots of sysadmins have situations like this of greater and greater complexity. Okay? <coughs> and you all see the bug, right? <laughs> ah! Okay. Well, maybe not. Okay, good. So there's still a talk left. Good. So um, the problem, of course, is a vital mission critical problem for the company, which is the manager can't connect to the web. <laughs> right. So why is this poor manager unable to do their important job? Well, so this is where, in some sense, the technical part of my talk begins. Okay? What we've been working on, and what several researchers have been working on, is tools to answer these kinds of questions. And what I like to do is to turn these kinds of questions into questions about logic. Okay? So we want to be able to answer a question like, can the connection from the manager's PC ever be allowed on port 80? Okay? And it's over TCP to any other machine on the outside. Okay? That's the kind of question we want to answer. But I am in particular interested in answering these questions statically, meaning I want to have a configuration and just like a compiler or a type checker answers questions without running the program, I want to be able to answer the question before installing the configuration so you don't find out mid-configuration that this is a problem. Okay? So all the usual arguments about when should things be done statically, when should things be done dynamically, we can have all the usual arguments about that. That's not my concern right now. I want to do things statically. We're good? Okay? So how are we going to answer this kind of question? Well, actually, it's very easy. All we have to do is to turn it into a logical problem. Okay? So we're going to turn it into a problem in logic. We translate this question into essentially the following logical query. Now I know you all can read this. Why do I know you all can read this? Because you read the talk abstract, and the talk abstract said, I expect only two things from you. What do I expect? Two things? The qualifier. Yeah, the, don't use big words. I wanted you to know that the backwards E means Exists. Everyone exists. exists and the upside down A, there isn't even an upside down A, so even better. Okay? So I wanted you to know backward E and upside down A, and you know that. So you know that what we're doing is we're turning this into a question where we ask, does there exist a P where P is of type packet? Okay? Does there exist a packet such that all of these predicates then hold? Okay? And essentially the reason if you're wondering why is there a second packet, P prime? It's because that first packet's going to get translated, remember? The NAT is going to translate it, right? So P prime is the result we get from NATing P. So essentially, that's now a logically different packet, OK? That's the question we want to ask, OK? So essentially, we want to say, find me a packet header such that some kind of question can be answered. Now, it's worth thinking a little bit about the, the combinatorics of this problem, right? So let's take a really, really, really sub-instance of this problem. Okay? All I care about is, you know, I've got this interface and I've got like, you know, IP packets and I've got TCP ports. I'm already dealing with like a hundred bit sized configuration problem. She said like, you know, two to the hundred potential, you know, possibilities here. Right? And, uh, you know, even if I just restrict it to manager and port 80, I still get about 50 bits. Okay? So the, the combinatorics of this are not pretty at all. Right? But here's the thing. There's this magical thing that happens. You take these queries, and you hand them to these things called SAT and SMT solvers, and something miraculous happens. They come back with answers far faster than they have any business coming back with. Okay? Now, 
I could give, in fact, I do a half a course on this topic, so I'm not going to do the half course in the next seven or so minutes. But all of you presumably went to Tikhon's talk this morning, where he probably told you about these things, told you more about how this works. And if not, go watch the recording of his talk. And if not, ask him for references or ask somebody else for references. This stuff kind of remarkably works. Okay. So why does it work? It works for the same reason your, you know, your self-driving car sort of drives and your, you know, Google sort of seems to know what you want and everything kind of fits. We live in the world of computer science sort of, right? So it's all cool. Okay. So, and I also want to give you a little perspective of being a computer science verification person. Let me tell you how I view the world, okay? I'm actually not even going to quote myself. I'm going to quote uh, Nadia Polikarpova, who's this extremely smart person. And she basically says this, right? Software engineers, linear is fast, quadratic is slow. Okay? Then you become a computer scientist, right? Like uh, you know, Aaron was saying, well, the problem with computer scientists is, well, P is fast, NP hard is probably where things get slow. But if you're a verification person, like decidable is awesome, right? The outside decidable, well, you know, we'll see. You're not going to stop working on the problem. It just takes a little longer. Okay? So we're going to send it off to this magical solver. And it's come and come back and say, either here's a packet, or there's no such packet. Nothing exists. OK? That's the out outcome of this thing. So notice it's not quite a binary. It says either you no, know, or I mean, this is like the little child, right? Like it says no to everything, right? But this one's a little better. This is like the child that gives you an explanation, right? So you can actually use the fact that it will give you some information back, and we'll see how to do that later. Okay? So specifically, we're in a space of logic called finite model finding. Uh, finite model theory is like a beautiful field, and it's not quite the same as classical logic, but it's really quite lovely in a space that I like to inhabit. We use tools like Alloy and so on, which I'd love to talk to you about. Okay. All right. So what happens is we take our policy, we take our query, we send it off to a SAT solver, and the SAT solver says, no, the query is unsatisfied. Okay. So it just says, no, right? There isn't, there is no way. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to tweak the query. We're going to basically reverse the query because remember, it either said, it said two things. It either said no or yes, and here's some support, right? Or vice versa, depending on how you set up the tool. So we're going to reverse the query, and it comes back and gives us a concrete counterexample. This is the beautiful part of it, okay? So I, I have a lot of respect for PL people who work in proof theory, but they're always like missing out on the fun parts, right? So the fun parts are automation and concrete counterexamples. And if you don't have automation, you don't have concrete counterexamples, it's like it's great to be for academics. But really, come on, right? Who's got time for this stuff? So um, here is our concrete counterexample. Our manager starts off, okay? And they send a request to a destination, www port. It goes to the internal firewall. Now, the internal firewall accepts this rule, and our system will tell you even which rule accepts the packet. Why? Because rule 4 accepted the packet. And then it applies the NAT, right? You all remember we talked about the NAT, the muxing? OK, so it muxes this, sends it out. And now the external firewall says, oh, what's this thing? FW2 static. I don't accept packets from that. Where does the external firewall accept packets from? Somebody said it. Say it louder. Louder. Manager. Can you hear it at the back? Manager. It only accepts from the manager's machine. And we've gone and changed the name of the source of the packets to say they're all coming from this hidden internal source. So it's going to be rejected. Okay. So this is, in fact, the problem that that person on the internet was having. And these are the kinds of subtle things that seem obvious in retrospect but are not at all fun to debug. And if you've ever set up a Cisco or any other kind of like router and tried to send packets through it and sat there with like a you know, Wireshark seeing what the hell is going on, they're like, oh, you know, I might as well, like, I don't know, take up an APL or something instead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, this is done a little more than logic. There's actually a whole thing that we've built called rule blaming. So the idea is you augment the query with extra requests that come back and tell you which, that's how I'm able to do the stuff in parentheses, right? It comes back and says, this rule caused this to be triggered, that rule caused this to be triggered. And so you basically extract a trace out of an atemporal situation. Okay, good. So far so good, you're all still with me? Great, all right. Um, it, you'll stay with me, by the way, there's never gonna be any APL in this talk, so. Um, <laughs> good, so um, here's what we can do. There's an easy fix, right? Our problem is we, our external firewall said, allow the manager, but we've just muxed it, so we're instead gonna allow, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Oh, you're a smart bunch, no fast is running anything by you. <laughs> now, let me step back and 
give you a little bit of like higher level perspective on, on verification and stuff that's sort of fashionable, okay? There's a classic question that we've asked that, you know, Dijkstra and people like that got us asking. And it's this verification question that basically asks the following, okay? It looks a bit like this, and essentially what it's saying in formal notation is does the policy or the program, whatever it is, right? In my case, my programs are actually networking policies. Sometimes they are also programs. You know, Tikhan was talking this morning about converting programs. Does the policy or program satisfy some kind of policy, a property, okay? Some formal property. Now, logicians love to argue about what goes in the middle, okay? If you want to incite a holy war, Ask them whether you use a single turnstile or a double turnstile, right? Oh my God. Okay, now, now, I can tell you, I could spend a half semester telling you why the difference between single and double turnstile is important, okay? It's really important. It wins Turing Awards. That's how important it is. But, but, the thing that academics never ask is, all of this depends, I mean, okay, we have programs, right? You've all got programs. You have programs, you got programs sitting around. Yes, you have programs, Uber or something like that. You've all got programs, right? All of you have programs sitting around. How many formal properties do you have sitting around on your file system? Exactly. Where the heck are we gonna get the properties from? Where do we get the properties? How do we write them formally? Are they good enough? Do they actually represent the set of things we care about? Because a formal verifier without properties is like a compiler without programs. It just sits there doing absolutely nothing. It's very good for the environment, but it's not very useful for getting anything done, okay? So, a different set of questions that I've spent about 10 years thinking about is a slight variation of this. I, I, I just told you, there's all this great tooling, right? There's stuff like Tikon talked about this morning that takes, you know, two to the power of 100 and answers questions about state spaces, two to the power of 100 size and like moments. Right? How can we reuse all of that tooling? How can we reuse all that cool technology, all those Turing awards, everything, to do something useful for people who don't have fees? Okay? Well, what is the goal of verification? What are we really trying to do? Anytime you do some kind of verification, and I mean even at the simplest case, like type checking, right? Type checking is a very rudimentary form of verification. What are we really trying to do? We're trying to say there are two artifacts and we want to make sure that one of them is redundant relative to the other, right? What does a type checker do? It's the type annotations you put down are a redundant statement, and the checker's making sure that they really are. <laughs> and if they're not, something went wrong somewhere, and it's going to try to give you awesome error messages, whatnot, help fix your problem, okay? <laughs> or you fix your problem, or something there's a problem, maybe you don't run your program, whatever. The point is it's about redundancy. So if we don't have fees, where can we get another artifact from? Well, the program keeps changing. The program is a temporal object, right? Anybody who's ever looked git log, what does that say? It says that your code is a temporal object. So maybe we can look at variations between programs. So in this particular talk, in this particular case, we're interested in helping people with policy evolution, in particular in studying what has changed, okay? So this is where I get to make like a really heretical remark. Right? Verification is, again, as when I wear my academic hat, it's a fascinating topic, it's a beautiful topic, but ultimately what we care about is gaining confidence in our systems. And there are many ways to gain confidence. One way, of course, is write lots of fees and check all of the fees. But another thing we can do is to say, look, I have an existing system. It works, whatever that means, all right? <laughs> It works, meaning I haven't noticed anything go wrong yet. Maybe it's because I didn't run the compiler. I wrote it, but I didn't run it, okay? Not that anybody would ever do that. But I have some confidence in my system. I have some confidence in my system, and what I want to do is I want to transfer that confidence over to the new version of the system. That's ultimately our goal, okay? And as people who write code, as people who work with working systems, I think we can agree that that's a pretty reasonable goal. So. Let me now show you very briefly how we can translate this question of what we call the change impact or differential analysis, right? If you have an engineering background, you'll recognize this term. How do we turn this into a logical question? So I'll give you a very simplified version of it. You can ask, I had an old network policy. I have a new network policy. 
What is a delta between those? Well, there's a syntactic delta, right? You run diff, right? And Git will show you the diff in like nice colors and everything even, it's awesome, okay? But what I care about is the semantic difference. And the semantics of a network is it's a function from packets to decisions, right? So a semantic difference would be previously some set of packets behaved this way, those packets now behave differently. The ones that are the same, I don't care about because that's my transfer of confidence. I was already happy with them. I don't need to worry about those, okay? So here is a simple form of that question. Previously, the external ACL, uh, the, the, that box on the outside, denied P prime, but now the new one accepts P prime. Or previously, it accepted P prime, now the new one denies P prime. That is a very simple example of a semantic difference. It's telling me, only show me the packets for which there's a difference in the outcome. Remaining packets I don't really care about, okay? And if I did that, if I had a less smart audience than this audience, my tool would help me identify what went wrong with the edit that I made, which is, as you have all already noticed, not only does the manager gain access to the internet, but so do the employees, and so do the contractors, okay? And that obviously would be a terrible idea. Now, I picked this example on purpose, because let's think about what normally happens. We come up with an edit, we apply the edit, right? The, the system admin's gonna like call the manager up and say, could you try again, just reload the web page and see whether you get it? What's gonna happen? It's gonna work. It's gonna work, right? Human beings are really bad. I'm gonna say this and pay attention because it's a very subtle statement. Human beings are really bad at thinking about the things that they don't think about. <laughs> right? And that sounds almost redundant, right? I mean, it actually sounds completely redundant, but it's not entirely redundant. If we don't think about the fact that uh, we should check for everybody else's outcomes as well, we just don't think about it. We're not going to write test cases. We're not going to ask. We're not going to call a contractor and say, hey, could you try testing the, you know, checking whether you can get web access? Because the contractor never called us with a question in the first place, right? So the idea of this kind of semantic differencing combined with the fact that we have these tools that explore all the possibilities, lets us track all of the things that can happen and all the things that can go bad, okay? Now, um, what we actually do is we think of this change as a first class entity because sometimes, as you can guess, you make a change and you can get a large number of outcomes, right? So we've built, the, we built this tool into Racket, obviously. So it's called Margrave, and it runs with like a Racket REPL and everything. But it wasn't going to be anywhere as cool as what you saw before, so I'm not going to bother running it for you. Okay? But the idea is you get a REPL. And where you can now take this change object, a thing that represents the set of changes, and do things with it. For example, you can say, Let's just show me the things that affect the external firewall. Maybe I don't care about the internal firewall. The external firewall is where I really care about things going wrong. Okay? In database terms, that's called constructing a view on something. You can construct a view on that change object. Okay? Or you might say, well, which entities got affected by this change? And that's a kind of query. Or which machines lost privileges? Which people gained privileges? Okay? Or here's something really subtle. Really subtle. Remember I said we don't have properties. But when you talk to admins, they will often tell you about properties they expected of a change. Properties of a change are not the same as properties of the system, right? System's a big complicated thing, I don't know. But what I do know is when I made this change, I wanted only the manager to gain privileges and nobody else. So now run that, query, that verification question of the change and come back and give me counterexamples to that, right? So this is this very empowering thing you get where you get this thing as an object that you can then perform more operations with. Make sense so far? Good. Okay, so you can do various things once you have this. You can do things like you can check different configurations. You can basically say, I have different upgrades I want to do. Which upgrade should I pick? Um, you can look for hotspots. Like I make a small change syntactically and it has a large change semantically. That might be a little worrisome because maybe that was intended, but maybe it was not. The other thing is, admins are always maintaining their things, right? They're always cleaning stuff up. Well, when you refactor, what is the change you want to see when you refactor, just clean up a policy? 
Say it all. Everyone, how big a change do you want? Zero. Zero, right? So when you refactor something, you can use this and check, make sure that I didn't screw anything up in the process of refactoring. So essentially, you get to do this kind of what if questions about your network posture. Um, one really cool application of this work that somebody else did is they did mutation testing. Remember, well, the whole point of mutation testing is you need an oracle that tells you whether anything changed. So using this as an oracle, somebody else was able to do mutation testing on network, network policies. Okay? So I've shown you two parts so far. First part was, assuming we had properties, I'll tell you a little bit about verification, cast it as a logical question. Second part was, assume you don't have properties, can we still do something to help? Yes, we can. We can still use these logical tools. Okay? Now, the third part is, let's say we do have properties. Okay? You should then ask the question, well, if you have a property statement, why are you bothering to write any policy at all? Maybe we can do it automatically. Okay? So that's the third thing I want to do. I want to ask, can we generate the configuration automatically? Okay? And I'm going to show you again the connection to logic, because what we're really asking is, can we find a configuration, that's a backward E question, okay? such that for all packets, which is an upside down A question, right? whatever property goal we state is going to hold. So for example, I might have a property goal like this that says the manager tries to connect to the internet, they can always get to the internet even taking into account NAT. All right? But there are many, many property goals you can state. So if you're a networking person, you're, you care about things like I don't want routing loops, right? I don't want to make sure, I want to make sure that anything that's forbidden is actually blocked. Or I might care about like, you know, I only allow return traffic if I initiated a packet, right? So there are active protocols where you have to first ask something to the outside and then it's allowed to start something new on a different port, but not otherwise. These are all properties you might want to state and maybe synthesize automatically. So this part is now I want to, so far I've given you pretty straightforward stuff. Now I'm going to get a little more complicated because I want to push you all a little bit. You okay? You ready for that? Okay, because I'm going to do more than just back exists, I'm also going to do for alls. So, here is what the configuration synthesis question is. It's asking, can you find me a configuration such as for all possible traces of the system? If the trace is a valid trace, under the, you know, I start in some C and then I run the system, if that's a legal trace, then it obeys the goal that we have. So again, we've turned this into a pretty simple question about logic. Okay? Now, there's a very simple question, but it's completely intractable. Okay? Hopelessly, totally intractable, because it's a statement about all possible traces, not all possible states. Remember, we were talking about state spaces? That is one state. Now think about that many states times like whole traces of those things. Okay? We could work through the combinatorics, it's pretty bad. Like even verification people, it's like on the wrong side of decidable, right? It's so it's so bad it might it'd be better off we're on decidable. <laughs> now I'm gonna show you two other questions that are actually very tractable. I mean tractable by you know the standards that I've established for this talk. Okay? One of them, this one's kind of a cheat, okay? So it's a bit of a cheat. Basically, it says, I'm going to take the same question, but I'm only going to ask for all traces and a small fixed set of traces. You're like, yeah, okay, that's not shocking, okay? <laughs> but we'll see, we'll see, we'll see how to use it. The other thing that's actually tractable is what's called an existential query, where basically, I'm going to fix C. I'm not asking for all traces, right? I'm just asking, does there exist a trace that fails the C that I've given, right? Basically, you give me a system configuration, and I will come back and tell you whether there's a counterexample for that system configuration. Okay? These two things are tractable. And there's a very useful insight, because now we can use these in the following way in a process that's called counterexample guided interactive synthesis, or CGIS. Okay? Here's the idea. It's a very cool idea. You start with the empty set of traces. We haven't figured out anything yet. Okay? Come up with a candidate C. Well, that's very easy, right? I mean, like just about anything you come up with because, you know, what do I have? I have an exists a C for all T, right? But T is the empty set, so pretty easy, okay? Now, supposing I'm unable to come up with any configuration even for a small set of traces. Well, then obviously there's not going to be a configuration for a larger set of traces, right? So I can fail 
and say, I'm sorry, there is absolutely no way to synthesize. Your expectations are unreasonable. Okay? You gotta go back and come back with a different set of properties. Okay, but that's not what usually happens. What usually happens is I get a candidate C. Aha! Now I can take this candidate C and ask, is that okay? Or is there a trace for which that C does not work? Well, if there isn't, it's unsatisfiable, then I found a configuration that has no counterexamples. We're done. We spit that out and we can go and install this on our machines. But of course, that's not what's usually going to happen. What's usually going to happen is it's going to come back and say, no, 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 it doesn't work. Here's a counterexample. Well, you just add T to S and continue again. <clears throat> now, if you're really sharp-eyed, you're going to be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This loop only exits in those two conditions, and it only exits in this condition if we've gone through all the T's. Isn't that the thing you said you were trying to prevent? Yes, it was. And that's the part I don't have time to talk about. <laughs> because that is an entire research project in itself. But I'm trying to give you a feel for the idea. I'm trying to give you a feel for the problem. I'm trying to give you a sense that we can take these difficult and interesting questions and turn them into tractable ones. Okay? And hopefully that I've done a little bit of. So in fact, if I take the property that I had before, one of the things that will synthesize is it will happily synthesize this fix. Because this fix doesn't violate our property. Our property is manager has to be able to connect to the internet. Manager can connect to the internet. Okay? So it will generate this configuration. So you need some additional properties as well. For example, you might say non-manager can't access the web. And when you do that in about two or three iterations, it'll quickly converge and give you the property that you would desire. Okay? And in fact, let me give you an English, show you what it'll actually do. What it does is it takes just the manager's machine and gives it a different interface name. It says like, you know, it says IP sources. If that, if uh, you change it to like forward to the static name for the manager, basically it's a gensum, okay? It's gonna generate a new name and it's gonna map just the manager's name to that new name, machine to that new name. And then the outside firewall only allows the web to be pierced if it comes from that new name that the manager got, okay? But this is a thing that we can generate completely automatically. Okay? Through the power of logic, we can have a machine generate this for us and give us a configuration that we can install all by stating the properties. So, um, let me recap what I've told you about. I've actually told you about three different problems now. The first problem was a verification problem. Okay? I'm gonna fix a configuration and I'm gonna ask, given a goal, does this goal get violated? Is there any behavior that violates this goal? The second problem I said is, well, suppose we don't have any goals. We're not, we don't have them. We don't know what our goals are. Well, we can still do something very interesting, which is we can ask, is there any behavior such that the behavior acts differently under different configurations? Okay? And you can actually <coughs> do this NRE way. You don't have to just do it binary. You can do this NRE. It's not hard to generalize. But then the third problem I gave you, and this is very much an active research question right now, is supposing I do have goals, why bother writing any policies at all? Why not get the computer to generate my spit out my entire configuration for me, right? So for the two people in the world who are hardcore logicians and system administrators, <laughs> okay, they can just be logicians and get the system administration for free and then go out and spend the rest of their time, you know, on Unter den Linden or something like that. Okay? So, those are three problems. But notice that I presented it this way because I want to point out that ultimately they all just boil down to asking questions using logic and using the tools that you heard about this morning. Okay? So there are two underlying principles here. The first is how do we state the problem? We state the problem using the beautiful tools of logic. The other part is how do we solve the problem, which is an algorithmic question. And the way we solve that problem is using these SMT and SAT solvers. Basically, it turns out you don't realize this, but there's actually another kind of search engine out there that's really awesome. Okay? It's combinatorial search, and it does equally astounding things. Okay? So that's, that's a little bit of like an overview of bunch of work that some of it is mine, some of it is not mine, uh, but I want to give you a sense of like where the research community is going because one of the things that's cool about developer conferences is 
We have people who are trying to be at the cutting edge or maybe beyond the cutting edge, certainly even beyond where the developer world is, and are curious to hear what's coming down the pike and what are interesting techniques out there that you might learn about and maybe even adopt. And so I wanted to give you a feel for what's out there and what, what people could be doing. Okay? There's a lot of things you still need to think about. For example, how good are these things at synthesis or verification? Well, it depends on how good your models are. And the models are painful, painful to write down. Right? I mean, you have to write down a spec of what a Cisco IOS box does. Okay? I've done this for JavaScript and Python. It was years of my life that I will never get back. Okay? So we can do this. In fact, one of the things I'm thinking about right now is I figured out how to turn this into a machine learning problem, but it turns out the machine learning problem we need to solve is exactly the dual of the machine learning problem that the AI community has, so there's no techniques out there. Okay? But we, can, we have to think about this. We have to think about how we can generate these models and how we can generate these models tractably. The next question is, which examples do we present? If I want to give examples to a user and I want the user to make decisions on the basis of those examples, I have to make sure I present like good ones. And we've done a bunch of work on, exam on trying to do things like minimization, giving you nice small examples. Everyone here is sort of mathy, right? Like half of you at least are. So you appreciate the principle of minimality, right? Good mathematicians appreciate minimality. But then it turns out if you actually do the HCI research on this, Minimality is an absolute and complete disaster, okay? And so I've also spent the past six, seven years doing HCI research in education and on logic and so on. And it turns out I could give you a whole bunch of reasons why minimality is a bad idea. In fact, in general, the principles that we appreciate as mathematicians turn out to be pretty bad for people who need to make sense out of the output. I know, it's kind of sad, okay? <laughs> so, that's, why, that's great, I mean, this is like full employment for me, but not so great for you, perhaps, okay? So, um, oh, by the way, I also want to tell you, um, the Journal of Functional Programming, uh, to celebrate uh, Bob Conf and RacketFest, has put out a bunch of articles free, so if you want to grab some articles, just go grab them before they put their paywalls and whatnot back up. There's a URL over there, uh, bit.ly, that's a two, uh, U, one, S, T, E, N, and those are uppercase, lowercase. Go grab those articles, There's, uh, there should be some good stuff over there. Um, and so if you want to know more about this work, it's a tool called Margrave. Uh, Margrave is, uh, is uh, basically a medieval access control manager. <laughs> okay, those are some URLs. Go grab those papers. Um, and uh, I'm now happy to take questions. Maybe, maybe, maybe. So as a PL person as well, I think about this a lot. And when I wear my networking hat, I don't think about this because there's no point. Okay, but when I wear my PL hat, I very much do. The problem is if you bring the logic and the, conf and the, program the configuration languages too close together, now the configuration is just as hard as writing down a property. And if people aren't very good at writing properties, they'll suck at writing configurations. What's worse is that they don't understand logic very well. They will not suck at writing configurations. They will suck at writing configurations that do what they want. They will write down a statement. I, I am shocked, maybe I shouldn't be shocked, but I am shocked by how difficult it is for people to reason about universal quantification for alls in the case of the empty set. Okay? And if you really make it like logic, well, we know that false implies everything. Right? So if you had logic as your configuration language and you'd written down a policy where something implies some other access you really want to guard, and this for the, con the antecedent were false, you've just given away all the access. Right? So there's a separate question of how do we teach people to write logic? Right? Very much an active que research question for me and for my PhD students right now. We're thinking hard about that and trying to figure out how to get people to do, be good at it. But till we have a good answer to that, I don't want to go, I don't, I'm not ready to buy your point of view. So do you want the, so it's hard to write properties. It's hard to write configurations. 
what is the yeah we're screwed i mean if your point is that we screwed yeah we're screwed okay. yeah okay good <laughs> other hand yeah so there are all kinds of logics temporal logics logic, logic, data logic. yep Modal logics, deontic logics, etc., etc. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We tend to use first order logic. So we use first order logic with transitive closure. Transitive closure is really useful for expressing things like reachability properties, like, for example, network packet reachability. Um, first order logic generally fits quite nicely with the solver frameworks that we have. Um, one of the things we have for some of the questions here is now, as you might know, as you, you seem to know, first order logic is in general undecidable. But there are sub languages of first order logic that are actually decidable. And one of the things we've done is we've actually constructed sub, sub typed sub languages of first order logic that fit our problems that are decidable. So we use tools that require bounds, but we can automatically generate the bounds and get completeness out of it. So first order logic plus transitive closure, that's, the, what, that's what you should be thinking. Okay? There, 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 and there. Yeah. You go. Uh, especially with the, with the last comment, many of the things that you uh, told us about sound very similar to what people are doing, for example, in, in like distributed systems, very model based verification of what's happening there. Is there something about uh, the field of network configuration that kind of changes? Yeah, uh, great question. How is, network, how is networking different? One of the great things about networking that's different, there's sort of two things. One is um, there's a beautiful abstraction called the packet, right? Well, I mean, you know, when I'm a programmer, I don't get, I mean, like, I mean, x86, but that's not neither beautiful nor much of an abstraction, right? But when I think about networks, I get to think about this one thing, and everything gets viewed through that lens, and that's actually very powerful. The other thing is, in general, the policy languages that people use right now, crappy as they may be, are typically short of Turing complete. And when they're short of Turing complete, you can do a lot of things where when I'm trying to verify distributed programs, I don't get to make any of those assumptions. So those are two major differences. And then. Have you looked into uh, resolution-based Turing Yeah, theorem provers have the problem that I don't get automation. I need automation, right? So you could. Part of what we're doing here is we're writing, we're, we're, we're like writing the back of a dragon, right? The dragon is sat SMT solvers. They're amazingly fast. They get faster. Like I go to sleep and in the morning it gets faster without me doing anything, right? And that's, so, so our questions are expressed as logic, but our tools are built on top of the solvers. And that's a critical difference, right? So until I can get resolution theorem provers that are automated and as fast, not much use to me. So we've looked at it, but it's nice. It's something I teach in my courses, but not a thing that I can use on a daily basis. There was a hand over here somewhere. Yes. Um, yeah, go. Um, <laughs> so this tool is helping administrators make sure that they have a correct understanding of the configurations that they're writing. Um, and obviously, your tool has to understand the configuration language properly. There's also the third thing is that the router has to understand the configuration properly. So I'm curious, have you run into situations either where configuration language itself is ambiguous, or there's bugs in the router such that your tool says something different. Great point. OK, so um, the question about um, the quality of reasoning depends on the quality of models. That's a statement about what we can assume about the behavior. Now, one of the things I care a lot about is um, conformance to reality rather than conformance to paper specification. So in my PL modeling too, like JavaScript, right? There's JavaScript on paper, and there's JavaScript in practice. And we care a lot about JavaScript in practice. So I, that's not a guarantee that we know about all the bugs, obviously. But, but there are, you can do more and less to try to conform with reality. Now, in terms of ambiguity, yeah, they're full of ambiguity. OK? And uh, yeah, if, if, we, if we could change the world, it would be great. And uh, we, it's kind of a best effort in that regard. So okay? there are situations where the tool will tell me one thing and then the router will actually do something. Not that we know of. If we find those, we will try to fix those. We don't want that to happen. But can I give you any kind of formal guarantee? You know, Alan Perlis said you can't go from the informal to the formal through purely formal means. Okay? We're trying to, you're asking me how do how do you get from the informal to the formal through purely formal means? I'll say by Perlis, epigram, whatever. I can't. Okay? Yes. So people have done things like that. So for example, there was a very nice piece of work that uh, was in Mike Gern's dissertation called Nikon that would run the program and try to generate a few things and say these are possible properties. The problem is 
the set of behaviors of a program is like enormously large, right? So I could tell you, oh, it looks like you never go past a particular loop index. Is that something you want? And you might be, yeah, that was something I really would have liked. But like the actual, I mean, think about, think about a large, somebody mentioned distributed systems, right? Think about a distributed system. Think about the, the imagine writing, a, going from an implementation to saying, I think you meant Paxos, <laughs> right? So that's a sort of arbitrarily complicated problem, and I don't think we have any clue. So I think it's a legitimate question. It's a completely legitimate question, um, but it requires some pre-knowledge of what kinds of properties one might have meant to see whether those existed or not. But the whole world of properties is just way too big that I don't know how to do that, and I don't know anyone else who does either. Right? We can only do this successfully in very minuscule special cases like array indexing and things like that. There was a hand back there for a while. Not, not anymore. That's it. Time is yeah. up. Oh, Anyways. time is up. Okay, very good. Thank you.